So we've gone through a few simple models to kind of give you a flavor for some of the things that HA-based modeling has been used to explore in the past. In many of those contexts, HA-based modeling was used almost as a thought experiment to explore uh, potential theories about the way the world works or to understand how uh, different uh, parameters relate or things along those lines. But HA-based modeling can also be used to create very complex models. Um, and so one natural question might be, how big in advance can it get? Well, in NetLogo alone, which we'll talk about here, you could have tens of thousands of agents of patches. In fact, I've seen now uh, models with hundreds of thousands and potentially even millions of agents and patches. You can have very complex decision makers, decision makers within the agent who are optimizing some sort of economic market or who are trying to make a decision based upon all the past behavior they've had. Um, you could see many different agent types. So you could have five or six or dozens of agent types within the model. You could have models of whole cities and how they're integrated. Um, and one of the nice things about not only NetLogo, but many of the agent-based modeling platforms out there is that they allow you to bring in additional tools um, that are available outside of those software packages. So you could integrate, for instance, the statistical analysis package in order to use that to its fullest extent within the system. Now, what constrains how big a model can get? Well, that's an interesting question. A lot of times it has to do with the computational power you have, the amount of time you have, the complexity of the agents, right? The more complex the agents are, the more computational time they're going to take. Right, um, and you know also the environment. And so for in this particular context, we're gonna now talk about two particular types of environments that are often used within agent-based modeling. Um, one is more of a spatial type model, and the other one is more of a network type model. So one of uh, the models that I really like, or one of the groups that I like that does a lot of agent-based modeling is a group called the Redfish Group uh, that builds a lot of models in NetLogo actually and uses them quite successfully to understand complex problems that are, that are around them. Um, and, uh, you know, and so this particular model that I'm showing you is a visualization of a very complex um, traffic intersection. So it kind of feeds naturally from uh, the simple traffic model that we were looking at before, right? Um, and now here still, you know, you've got kind of these representation of agents and things like that, but it allows them to kind of look at and try and understand would a um, traffic network such like this actually work? So this is another one of my favorite models. This one was also built by the Redfish Group uh, under the principles of Stephen Guerin and Owen Densmore. Uh, and in this particular case, what they were trying to do was to help uh, the Santa Fe uh, safety departments with understanding a evacuation or a, a mass egress actually uh, from an annual event that happens in Santa Fe every year called uh, the Zozobra, which is uh, from what I understand, a little like Burning Man. I've never been myself, uh, but apparently at the end of it, they build this big thing and they set it on fire. Uh, and, you know, it's something where you obviously want to control a little bit the environment around you. Uh, and what I find interesting about this uh, particular model is that, you know, it led to a lot of interesting conversations about how to set up uh, exits correctly from the event. But if you notice, there's one particular little agent that runs off towards the north end of the screen. Uh, and this kind of helps to, or the top end of the screen, this kind of helps illustrate one of the points about agent-based modeling is that when you construct an agent-based model and you give the agents goals, if you leave any kind of gaps, any kind of errors in the goals that you hadn't thought through, they will find it, right? And in this particular case, this agent seems to have found some sort of break in the fence or something along those lines uh, that allows it to exit in a completely different manner from the rest. Anyways, just another great example of using uh, agent-based modeling in a spatial setting to explore some more complex phenomena. A different project that I was involved in actually was at the tail end of the project was the it was uh, a procedural modeling of cities project, right? In this particular context, NetLogo was being used to try and see if it was possible to um, paint cities. In other words, to create cities that could have 
the flavor of something like Rome because you had painted a set of seeds down that would create that, but not actually be Rome. It would just feel like Rome, right? Um, or cities that might have the flavor of something like Paris, but not actually be Paris and things along those lines, right? Um, and in fact, one of the partners on this was Maxis, who actually um, builds the Sim City uh, toolkit, right? And so we were able to take the models that were rendered in that logo, which is what this picture is, and then put them into to a GIS piece of software and then also build them up into the SimCity rendering environment. Um, and whenever possible, I always try and include a reference to a paper uh, that kind of talks about that process. So there's the Western paper. I also happened to be on the committee of a student who was doing some very interesting policy analysis of agent-based modeling. And again, this is in the spatial context. So she was actually bringing in data from a variety of different geographical sources, including um, the rail, uh, some rail networks and some description of demographics and things like that for the greater Chicago land area. And with the geographic data, she built also a model of, uh, of transportation decision making for each individual agent within the model, which was at the household level, right? Uh, and so in that model, they would, the agents would actually make a decision based upon various questions like how expensive it was to buy gas or whether or not how expensive it was to buy a car, whether they would use a private car or public transportation to get uh, to their work destination, right? And what was interesting about this is that, you know, a lot of the data was actually held outside the ABM in the GIS landscape. Um, and then there was also the integration of actually a traffic demand model that was integrated as well outside the ABM. And that the ABM only controlled um, kind of the integration of all these things together, the policy analysis, as well as the decision making of the individual households. Um, and what she was trying to explore was to explore when you implemented um, different policies, was it possible to revert to a more public transit world from a world which was descending into a, where everyone has their own private transit system?